Order, order. Dean Russell to move the motion. Whilst he's pouring his water out. I beg to move the House has considered inclusion of green belt land in local plans. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to serve under your chairmanship um, today. Thank you. I've asked for this debate today as a number of my constituents, quite rightly, um, have written to me and spoken to me over recent months with concerns about potential building on Greenbelt, in particular in the um, ward of Carpenters Park. And whilst it's my understanding that as a Member of Parliament I'm not allowed actually to interfere in the planning process, nor do I have any control over housing targets or a planning authority's local plan, I would like to confirm this with the Minister today, and I have several questions and some context to those questions as we go through to see if there's anything I can do as the Member of Parliament to ensure that Greenbelt in Carpenters Park is not included in the local plan. I would be grateful to the Minister if he could confirm that this is indeed the case, as I'm deeply concerned, I have to say, about the inclusion of Greenbelt into the local plan during the recent uh, consultation process. As the Watford MP, I'm acutely aware of where we are situated. Uh, we're not in London, but we're inside the M25, and the ever-growing expansion of the capital over decades has rightfully led to government intervention to protect our local green spaces and to protect our great town from being swallowed up in the metropolis. My constituency covers two distinct local authorities, Watford Borough Council and Three Rivers District Council, and this is the latter that I will focus on today. Within Three Rivers, you will find Carpenters Park, and I, I would love to invite the Minister to, to visit at some point. He will see that it's a wonderful part of my constituency. It's got beautiful open green spaces, but most at the heart of the community are the people. And I've had the, wit the luxury of witnessing those over the past two years, how the community comes together, how it works together. And in particular, in this instance, I'll illustrate that with the work that they've done to protect their green space um, in the face of the local plan inclusion. I've had the opportunity, in particular, to meet local residents, uh, most recently um, in a community meeting organised by Councillor Coltman, Councillor Donna, Dun uh, Donna Duncan, Councillor Shanti Manu, and others. Uh, where I was able to speak to local residents about their concerns about the Green Belt and the local plan consultation. Um, and in addition to that, I went to a, a meeting with a particular campaign group who were set up in particular in, in response to the local plan consultation. And these included Rue Gruel, Terry Voss, Ketel Patel, Lester Wagman, Ross King, Jack Elliott's, um, and Pandora Melly, who was un unfortunately unable to attend on that night. And since then, Rue, Terry and Lester have set up their own campaign group, which they're called at the moment, Can't Replace Green Space, which I don't think you can get more on the nose than that statement. What they've identified through their work is by going out through old-fashioned engagement, they've knocked on doors, they've spoken to people, they've helped them fill out the consultations, they've done an enormous amount of work to encourage local residents to respond to the local consultation. And what we've seen is an incredible response with thousands upon thousands of signatures of people saying they do not want that patch of their area, quite rightly, to be built on with housing. And I should note that as part of this, this isn't about nimbyism. They've got incredibly strong, uh, powerful um, reasons why this should not be included. And it includes the fact that actually there are potential brownfield sites that could be built on in other areas. So it is not a last resort to look at these areas. In my efforts to understand if I, as a local Member of Parliament, can do anything to stop the inclusion, I've spent many hours researching local planning rules extensively, more so than I have expected to, <laughs> to understand uh, as an MP. And as such, I hope you'll bear with me as I share these points. As I understand it, and I would like uh, appreciate um, confirmation of this, the National Planning Policy Framework provides the framework against which local planning authorities draw up their local plans and determine applications for planning permission. Chapter 13 of the framework, the NPPF, deals specifically with protecting greenbelt land, and in it, it states clearly that established greenbelt boundaries should only be changed in exceptional circumstances, exceptional circumstances, where fully evidenced and justified. The MPPF is also clear that any inappropriate development that is harmful to the Green Belt should also only be approved in very special circumstances. Paragraph 137 states that concluding that exceptional circumstances exist to justify change in the Green Belt boundary 
the authority should be able to demonstrate that it has fully examined all other reasonable options for meeting its identified need for development. And I fully understand residents' concerns that three rivers, in their view and in mine, have not yet been able to demonstrate this in their local plan consultation. Paragraph 149 also states that the exceptions where building on the green belt will not be considered inappropriate. Since being elected, I've raised multiple times in private meetings with the former Secretary of State and, and, and the, the current Housing Minister as well, my concerns about overdevelopment across Watford in general, about in particular tall towers. But given this is, debate is about the Green Belt, I will not cover those right now. One of the aspects of that was that I asked directly in the Chamber a few months ago if it is the case that um, housing targets needs are not set in stone and that they are a starting point for negotiation. And I'd be grateful if, if the Minister could also confirm that this is still the case and that actually a planning inspector can accept a lower housing need target um, in order for the green belt to be protected if a local plan sets out clear criteria and presents a credible and reasonable alternative. I've seen a number of articles recently in my local area saying that no lo local authority can challenge the housing needs set by the standard um, uh, method for assessing housing need. However, I would say that if indeed the local plan is the starting point for determining the planning process, then it would be most appropriate to use this as a mechanism to challenge the standard method in order to protect our precious green belt. It is possible, in my view. Indeed, from my research at the uh, House of Commons Library, it's concluded that the inspector can challenge local authorities in their desire to build on green belt land where they fail to challenge the housing need in the local plan. And from e examples, there were many I found actually, but in particular these two came to mind. Barnsley Metropolitan Borough Council, uh, where 77% of the borough is found within the South Yorkshire Green Belt, similar to Three Rivers where 76% of the districts is classified as Green Belt, the planning inspector found that, the, that exceptional circumstances did not exist to justify altering a Green Belt boundary which highlights the importance of local authorities only considering adjusting this boundary as a last resort. And this was also the case, I believe, for Rugby Borough Council, where the inspector found that green belt expansion would, I quote, breach the existing strong, clearly defined boundary, which would cause significant harm to the purpose of the green belt in this location. I feel at this point I want to clarify, though, that I'm not attempting to do point scoring politics here. This isn't about me trying to challenge the council to be difficult to try and do political point scoring or do a blame game. I want to try and be supportive and enable this debate to help support them in removing the green belt from Carpenters Park. And in particular, um, I would like to highlight that you know, this is really about local people. It's about local people having a say in their local area and through this process of consultation, making sure their voices are heard. And I'm hoping today will enable that even further. I've also um, raised the, uh, the challenge here that the engagement for the local plan absolutely has to come from people putting in petitions as well as putting in individual um, comments. One of the things that I have found, which I don't know whether it's a government policy or a local policy, and so if there is possible to give clarity, is that we've had thousands of people sign a petition, but that is only accepted as one single entry as a consultation rather than the thousands of, of signatories. Um, I've also chatted locally, and I've also found that Alex Haywood, the uh, Conservative leader on, uh, leader on the Three Rivers District Council, which is not in control currently, has confirmed that she would remove this area from the Green Belt. So it's not a lack of willingness to do so uh, from a, a political perspective. Um, I think there's another part here which one of the things that I won't go into in great detail here because it's been covered so much in the mainstream press and locally is that there's often a, a charge that it's, it's the national targets that government is inflicting upon local areas that's causing Greenbelt to be uh, at risk. Um, up until recently, I, I, I could sort of see the argument. You know, the Conservatives in their manifesto had a 300,000 target. Uh, Labour, I believe, had a million over the t term of, of Parliament. And the Liberal Democrats also had a 300,000 uh, 300, um, target. However, I uh, am led to believe that at the local, um, at the recent uh, Lib Dem conference, they voted to increase the national house building target to 380,000 a year. So uh, I, I doubt if that's the political argument that that holds weight anymore, given the fact 
that um, actually they've increased the house building target. So I don't want to get into that political battle other than to say I think it's very important that local residents are heard in this, irrelevant of some of the national politicking that, that goes on. So just to finish off, if I may, Chair, with some specific questions. Could the Minister confirm that the planning white paper that um, is just that, a white paper, and that despite some uh, of the press that happens at the moment saying that there's a bill passing through Parliament currently and uh, various announcements that have been put out in leaflets and, and in the press about what that bill, bill includes, actually that hasn't actually gone through Parliament yet. So anything that's talking about the planning bill is not yet factual and actually the white paper is just a white paper. So that's not the case. So therefore any assumptions on what that will include uh, are not yet in the public realm. I would also be grateful if the Minister could uh, set out the reasons why the 2014-based household projections continue to be used seven years on uh, in determining the housing need according to the standard method and if this is likely to change in the future. I know that's something that residents have raised with me. And above all, I'm keen to stand up for residents in my constituency and for our green spaces. I can't tell you how important it is to make sure that carpenters Park stays the beautiful community that it is both in terms of place but also in terms of the people that it is today and I would like to make sure that continues to be the case for many years and decades to come. So I'm really grateful to be given the opportunity to speak about this incredibly important issue. The residents of Carpenters Park deserve to have their voices heard and as the MP I have been led to believe that we cannot as a, an MP be involved in the planning process however if I am able to be, please do let me know, because uh, I would like to be. Um, and if I cannot be, then if there, there is anything else that I can do to help our local residents. And it's as, um, with regards to those valid concerns, I would just like to see if we could get those answers to those questions so I can make sure that moving forward, Carpenters Park can continue to be the beautiful place and community it is. So thank you to the Minister for his time. Um, I look forward to any further guidance on how we can protect our local green space in Watford. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered inclusion of Greenbelt land in local plans. Minister. Um, Ms Noakes, it's a huge pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, it's also my particular pleasure to be able to address honourable members uh, as the representative of the new Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Now, Leveling Up is, of course, about uh, empowering local leaders and communities and also about creating nice places to live, both of which are, are highly relevant to this uh, debate. And I'd like to start by um, thanking my honourable friend uh, for securing this uh, important uh, debate. Uh, his constituency, of course, as he said, uh, includes areas governed by two local authorities, Watford and Three Rivers, and his constituents are hugely fortunate to have uh, my honourable friend as their MP. He is an absolutely relentless and articulate and learned champion for them, particularly on this issue. Um, he asked me at the end of his speech to confirm that he cannot interfere in the planning process. Uh, he cannot control what um, planning uh, numbers the local authority chooses to go for. I am happy to confirm that he is, is correct in what he says there. Um, let me start by reiterating this government's absolutely unwavering commitment to protecting the Green Belt. There has been uh, uh, no great advocate for the Green Belt and for our valued countryside. Uh, other than the Prime Minister himself, and he couldn't have been clearer in his address to the party conference two weeks ago. Homes should not be built on green fields if we can possibly help it, and we should focus instead on boosting construction on brownfield sites. And I will talk about both of those uh, today. Now, I am naturally very sympathetic to the concerns of local residents, but honourable members will appreciate that I, uh, of course, the Secretary of State has a quasi-judicial role in the planning system, so I cannot comment on individual uh, planning proposals today. While the government sets national planning policy in England, local authorities are responsible for local planning matters, including the distribution and density of development across the areas, the designation of land as green belt, and cooperation with neighbouring authorities uh, on matters which cross those local authority uh, boundaries. It is local plans that are the key documents through which local planning authorities can set out a vision and a framework for the future development of their area. But, crucially, planning must be carried out in a democratic consultation with local residents so that everyone can have their say. And the community's voice must be heard. Uh, my honourable friend talked about the central importance of uh, consultation and democracy uh, in his speech and the good work uh, being done by some of the groups in his constituency. And I'm sorry to hear that my honourable friend feels in his constituency there's been a tremendous democratic failure on the part of the council to, to listen and act on uh, residents' concerns. 
and he mentioned a couple of particular sites where that was the case. Now, in terms of the Green Belt, as my honourable friend knows, the manifesto on which this uh, government was elected is absolutely unequivocal in its commitment to not just protect the Green Belt and the countryside, but also to enhance it for future generations. Green Belt is vital for preventing urban sprawl uh, and for uh, stopping encroachment on our beautiful uh, countryside. And that is why national planning policy delivers strict protections for the Green Belt, along with strong safeguards against boundary changes and development. And councils must be two clear tests to make any changes. Uh, the first test um, uh, outlined in the national planning policy framework ensures that local authorities are prevented from changing a green belt boundary unless in exceptional circumstances. They must show that every other reasonable option has been exhausted and that includes using brownfield land, optimising the density of development and discussing whether neighbouring authorities can take some of the development. And local authorities must consult with local people before submitting a revised plan uh, to examination by inspector. And if a local authority finds that it really cannot avoid removing land from the Green Belt, it is expected to offset the loss of that land by environmental and access improvements to the remaining Green Belt. Now, the second test sets out where it is a Green Belt. Local authorities should regard the construction of most types of new building in that Green Belt as inappropriate. They should be refused planning permission unless there are very special circumstances. And let me use this opportunity to reassure uh, honourable uh, friends and members that we will continue to afford maximum protection to our Green Belt, a commitment that we stand squarely behind as we take forward our important agenda to level up the country. And as I say, it's important to stress that national policy uh, sets the expectation that local planning, planning policies and decisions should enhance as well as protect the Green Belt land. Uh, most of the Green Belt is, of course, countryside, often containing uh, valuable biodiversity soils and attractive landscapes. So, as the Prime Minister has made clear, we must reduce pressure on green fields by focusing on delivering beautiful homes on brownfield land, particularly in urban areas. The National Planning Policy Framework strongly encourages regeneration and the reuse of brownfield sites, especially for development to meet housing need and to regenerate our high streets and town centres as we all want. Local plans should support opportunities to uh, remediate contaminated land while identifying underused sites as the first priority. We were the first government to require councils to make registers of all their brownfield land. And of course, brownfield doesn't just mean derelict plots and very obvious brownfield. We've already uh, uh, widened permitted development rules, allowing extensions and adaptations and even demolition of those unwanted commercial buildings like boarded up shops and warehouses, which are natural candidates for uh, new homes. And the framework also makes it clear that uh, by achieving the right density of development in a neighbourhood can ensure that urban land is used efficiently. Minimum density standards and sort of gentle dentification, not tall towers, gentle dentification, encouraged by the new National Design Code guidance will help save groundfield land. Now there is a big difference between gentle density and tall towers and I would highlight to any council the pioneering work of Create Streets on this subject. But we do recognise that brownfield sites are harder to deliver, that in some circumstances uh, councils do require additional support to maximise their use. So we are helping to fund regeneration as well as favouring it through uh, legislation and guidance. Just last week we uh, allocated uh, 58 million to 53 councils through our brownfield land release fund and that funding will boost local areas by transforming unloved and disused sites into vibrant communities for people to live and work in. With the demolition of unsightly derelict buildings and disused car parks and garages. That is levelling up in action. And a clear example of our restoring pride in place, local pride, while building the homes this country needs. Crucially, this funding will help to protect the countryside and green spaces, and we expect another 5,600 homes to be built on these brownfield sites, supporting young people and families across the country into home ownership. And that is just the latest instalment. Government has made a significant investment to unlock brownfield sites. For example, the 4.35 billion housing infrastructure fund, the 4.95 billion home building fund, the 400 million brownfield housing fund and the 75 million brownfield land release fund. And furthermore, through land remediation relief, the government also provides a deduction of 100% from corporation tax plus 50% for any qualifying expenditure incurred by companies as they clean up uh, contaminated land acquired from third parties. So, no government has ever invested in uh, brownfield first regeneration like this and I hope that my honourable friends' councils will avail themselves of all this help to do brownfield first. 
In 2018, we introduced a new standard method in the new uh, national planning policy framework um, uh, for assessing local housing need, and my honourable friend uh, referred to it in his speech. This helps communities to gain a clear understanding of the minimum number of new homes uh, required to inform local plans. I must be clear, though, that the local housing need calculation is by no means a top-down imposed housing target, uh, nor does the method dictate where new homes go. It's just a starting point uh, when measuring an area's housing need, and the local authority still has to set its own housing target after taking account of uh, local constraints, including, of course, the green belt, and plan for the right mix of housing site and tenure and in the right places, of course. My honourable friend asked me to confirm, and I can confirm, that the use of the standard method in plan making is not mandatory. It is felt that if it is felt that circumstances warrant an alternative approach to using the standard method, the local authority can put forward for examination as part of its local plan, though that does come with the caveat that it will be scrutinised closely, of course. Last year, we improved the standard method further, and that resulted in a, uh, uplifting the uh, previous figure by 35% in our 20 most populated urban areas, a further move to support a brownfield-first, regeneration-led approach to development. And this enables us to plan for enough homes in a way that maximises the use of existing infrastructure and supports development that's close to shops, schools, local services, has good transport connections, and reduces the need for long journeys by car. It'll also help the, drive the regeneration of our high streets while levelling up our town and city centres right across uh, the country. So I want to thank my honourable friend once again for raising this issue today. And to raise our sights a bit uh, for a moment, the main purpose of the Green Belt is to ensure our towns and cities grow in a sustainable way. Now, of course, in the, in the lead-up to the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, the enormous potential of um, uh, the Green Belt and other greenfield land is very visible. Uh, uh, helping to support climate change resilience as part of our green infrastructure and as an aid to helping the natural world to grow and to recover, which makes it all the more important, of course, for communities to be able to engage with the planning process, making full use of the new digital tools that are available to ensure that councillors and our planning authorities uh, make the right decisions when they come to balance homes and jobs with protecting our precious countryside for future generations to come. The question is that this House has considered inclusion of green burnt land in local plans. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order.